Welcome to SFL This Week, Season 22, Week 10 edition. Start the clock. We are counting down to Seattle and San Diego tonight on the Monday Night Spectacular. Mike, just four weeks left in the regular season. Starting to get that early fourth quarter exhaustion. Got to power through, put the arms above the head. Four weeks left in this regular season. How you doing? I'm good, Cam. I'm good. Excited to uh, break down a, uh, another good week in the SFL and, and really excited to, uh, I mean, we're getting close, man. You know, the season, I feel like this season has flown by and uh, we've, we've already seen so many changes since, you know, the beginning of the season. It's drastically different. Some teams that started off hot and now they're, you know, kind of falling off and vice versa. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all shapes up and I'm excited to break it down with you. And here we go. The week 10 headlines were as follows. <laughs> Oh, Neil, more fourth quarter <laughs> magic. This team is ridiculous. Florida's improbable string of fourth quarter masterpieces continued in their win over Atlanta. 20th time is the charm. The 20th meeting between Carolina and Jacksonville left us uh, with a bang this weekend. An overtime victory for the Skyhawks, who are quietly climbing to four and five. The Vultures are circling again. They avoid their team record fifth regular season loss. And they climb all the way to seventh in the playoff standings. We'll be breaking down the updated playoff standings at the end of the show. Well's done, Vancouver. Kendra Wells and chance to win help the Legion to a momentous victory over the Ramblers. And L.A. is on the board. They snap their losing streak and leave the Corsairs again searching for answers. What caught your eye this week, Mike? Oh, man, it's got to be Florida for me. It's got to be Florida. I've never seen a team so good at, at just putting it together in the fourth quarter and, and making things happen. Like, that's the scariest part about Florida is they're not always playing their best, but you can always count on them to be clutch in the fourth quarter better than anybody in the SFL. So for me, that's the big thing that stands out this week. Yeah, uh, Florida was incredible. I think that uh, Baltimore played some incredibly clutch football. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, it was a, that Vancouver Indianapolis game. If you didn't catch it, those highlights will be big time. Uh, oh, that game, killer. Yeah. That, that game was uh, amazing. But first we have to start with the all gas, no breaks game of the weekend. That was Arizona and Tulsa. Surprisingly enough in the, that's, that's not it. Uh, it looks like none of our highlights have loaded. So I'm going to do that while Mike's going to tell you about his world. How you, what? Oh, what else caught your well, attention in the, in the SML? I think I forgot to do Well, something. listen, <laughs> uh, we can talk about L.A. getting their first win, right? L.A. getting their first win is huge, especially against a Queen City team that I think a lot of people uh, considered to be, you know, in the playoff race later in the season. So that's a really, really big thing for them. I didn't get to personally watch the uh, Indianapolis game. Um, but Indianapolis, Vancouver from, I mean, I, I popped in at the very, very end afterwards and I saw everybody talking about how clutch of a game it was and how close it was. And I mean, I even, I believe I even saw Jacob talking about like the playoff football, like element, how it really seemed like it was playoff football, which is not surprising. So, I mean, it's good to see Vancouver kind of putting some things together and, and keeping it tight in the, uh, in the Pacific. Um, but man, overall, I think it was really, really a, just a, a great performance around the board in, in the SFL this weekend. Um, Baltimore getting a win against, you know, the seven win Minnesota was was pretty elite. And again, just goes to show you that we can never count out the Baltimore Vultures because they're always going to be a top dog. It doesn't matter who they're fight, playing. They're always going to be able to compete in any game that they're in. And that I mean, that's massive. So since we're going ahead, breaking down the rest of the things on that on that uh, that <laughs> package there for us. Hey, thanks, Mike. I can always count hey. on you to uh, talk. That's great. Yeah, that's, there we go. That's, that's what you're here for. Okay, at least I remember to actually do them. Now we get to the highlights. Arizona and Tulsa. And TJ Punk started off the first drive hot. Four catches and the op the game's opening touchdown, 7 nothing. But you know who else started hot? Alexander West. First career catch. First career touchdown. Tied the game. Oh. At seven, Bismarck Wright takes a toss as Arizona answers back 14-7. And both teams are all over the scoreboard early. Third down and 10, deep in their own territory. Brown is picked off by Everett Garrison. And the all gas, no breaks first half continues. Garrison was fighting for a return. Gets down to the 15-yard line. Arizona would not turn the ball over. They wouldn't get a field goal off of it. They would fully 
take advantage of a rare turnover in this one. Handoff again to Bismarck Wright. He is balling. He had a career high of SFL yardage in this game and puts Arizona up 21 to seven. Does a little dance, getting down tonight. Hey, how about the very next play? Michael Brown, a 70 yards to Jay Viper. G-O-N-E gone. Tulsa just like that right back in this thing as Scorpions chase him into the end zone. 21-14. Everybody's got the moves. Now, just before the end of the half, 24-14. This saved the Desperados. Travis Arthur with the deflection and the pick. It flipped momentum as Arizona nearly took a 17-point lead into the half, but they failed to do so. Michael Brown instead hits Lars Bazaar early in the fourth quarter to tie the game at 24. Now he's dancing as the sun sets in Arizona. Third and goal, Bismarck Wright, two touchdowns, 54 yards, you see an SFL career high, but he went in on this play, it was third and goal, it was DJ Moses and it was David Ware with the denial at the goal line, forcing a field goal out of Arizona on fourth and goal. Now down three, Michael Brown to Gabriel, Manning in the back of the end zone gives him the lead, and we've got to we we wait, uh, wait what are we doing here? We got to we rewind it because we got to hear Tyler's call. They're on the outstretches of the red zone now, looking for more action. Looking end zone, Gabriel Manning touchdown Tulsa. Call that. All right, that's one way to do it, Tyler. Way to go. <laughs> Tul Tulsa Damn. takes the lead. <laughs> Tyler hitting uh, some Mariah Carey notes. There. I'm telling you, it's crazy. And, uh, oh, that was Whitney Houston. 31 yeah. 27. <laughs> Tulsa's up by four. Fourth and 10. Ashley Jackson needs an answer on the rollout. Jackson fires down the field. It is knocked away and incomplete. And how do you do, Tulsa? They win 34 27 and hold off the Arizona Scorpions. A stunner. Your initial reaction, Mike. Man, I'll tell you, that is a. Uh, I, I cannot believe how close of a game that was. And and look, the entire time going into this game, I'll be honest, I had Arizona winning this game, and it's only because Tulsa was so one-dimensional with their offense all season. They've been one-dimensional, just the Gabriel Manning effect, right? But I think the difference in this game is they got other people involved. You saw that huge touchdown by Jay Viper, right? They uh, the Lars Bazaar gets in there for, for a score. I mean, they really spread the ball around, and I think that that's what really – you know, kind of uh, change the element for this Tulsa offense. And I think that, that was a, a crucial thing for sure. Two weeks removed from uh, Arizona's victory over Baltimore. And now all of a sudden, Baltimore has a better record than Arizona. And Arizona's lost two straight heartbreakers. The question, Mike, is can they recover? They have a week 14 bye, so they have to act quickly. They have Minnesota left on their schedule. They have Houston left on their schedule. These are not uh, not going to be easy victories as Arizona just searches for wins right at this point. Yeah, it, it's going to be tough, um, but they've, you know, if, if anybody can do it, it's Arizona Scorpions. We've seen yep. them, you know, they're always in the thick of it. I mean, Eddie Gage is among the best as far as, you know, getting his team in the right position to win. So, you know, we'll see how they uh, they look around the, uh, the, the home stretch of the season. I mean, I think it if anybody can do it, it's them for sure. Well, I already need a break. Thankfully, Ashley Jackson is here to give me one as PGI returns with Tulsa's kicker, Takeda Yuki. Welcome back to PGI, where I am joined with kicker slash hunter Takeda Yuki over from the Tulsa Desperados that had a nail-biting, fantastic win over the Arizona Scorpions. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, the Tulsa Desperados was my very first team I uh, started with as a quarterback. So it is a bittersweet thing um, to to play those games, you know. But welcome to the show, man. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, I mean, it was a little. Oh my! I could uh, my I my heart was up in my chest all through especially on that last drive when you got down, I believe it was to the 31 on fourth and eight. And I said, oh, God, it's a Hall of Fame quarterback, a Hall of Fame running back, a soon-to-be Hall of Fame tight end, or is CJ Punk in the Hall of Fame already? No, no, not yet. 
We're, you will be pretty sure of that. That's coming <laughs> fairly soon. But somehow the pass goes to Mike Churchill. Marco Swift lays a lick on him. The ball falls to the ground and by the grace of God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's all I that I was like, because I honestly nobody nobody gave us a chance. I didn't give us a chance. I mean, we're going up against perhaps one of the most talented offenses in the SFL. I mean, who who in their right mind would have picked us? Hey, the thing is, you had a Gabriel Manning, and we knew that Gabriel, Gabriel Manning was giving us problems in practice. So the thing is, the, the right game plan at the end of the day prevailed. And it was a fantastic game to watch. Exciting, as you said, through, um, through and through. I have to give a shout out to Travis Arthur, our free safety. Because he, yeah. on your second drive, I believe, picks you off in the, picks you off in the back of the end zone. Was it? It? Well, not quite the back of the end zone, but... He picked you. He picked you off on what would have been, because we only we only ended up winning by a touchdown. Had you scored on that last drive that Travis Arthur didn't pick up, this game would have been tied, would have gone to overtime, and only God knows what would have happened there. So, major credit to Travis Arthur for a, even though that interception was early, it took seven points off the board. Yeah, seven points that eventually we, we definitely could have used at the end of the day. But that is what you pay for. You pay for the emotional content that this league and that this game delivers. So um, at the end of the day, like again, again, better game plan one. And you guys did a phenomenal job. So congratulations on your win. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you do for how, how you guys end your season off. Have a good one. Thank you so much for taking time out to be with me today. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Back to you. Thank you, Ashley. We love Takeda on this show, and uh, that was a good one. Let's get back to the highlights as we go to Baltimore, where this game could be summed up in two words, touchdowns and fi- and field goals, forwards. 7 nothing. Baltimore takes the lead. They get a touchdown, <laughs> third and goal. Isaac Knox fights back, but Frank Smith wins the battle. Minnesota kicks a field goal, 7-3. Later in the first half, Johnny Reno to Colin Hart. He's going to get inside the red zone, but Minnesota comes up empty. They get a field goal, 7-6. Baltimore just before the half, inside the five. Touchdown to Ivory Irvin, 14-6. Baltimore out in front. Third down and eight in the red zone. Jack Wigmore. Ivory Irvin, touchdown. Baltimore's up 21-6. to That was just what was happening through the first 25 minutes of this ball game. But this was the almost the key play of the game. One minute to go in the third quarter. Fourth and short. And Warren Murray is stuffed by Stephen Black, who had a phenomenal uh, performance in this one. Late in the third, Johnny Reno and the offense starts to get it moving. T to Queen down to the 10-yard line. First and goal. Minnesota's bench is hyped about it. And they get the touchdown, Mike. It, I, I thought I thought Minnesota had a real shot after this play. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Tita Queen coming up really big right here. And and I really thought, I mean, you, st- you saw them start, you know, right there, starting to make a comeback and really driving things, putting things together. Jay Taylor snatches that away from the uh, jaws of defeat. And Giovanni Bolt in the end zone. Third and seven. You see Minnesota before this third down was just two for eight. That is a heck of an adjustment by Quake Mam with five minutes to go. Minnesota down eight, and they are within striking distance. Third and goal. Here we go again. 329 to go in the fourth, and Johnny Reno looks in zone, and it's deflected. Had a man wide open in the flats, just didn't see him. Keenan Samuels with the knockdown. So now it's Fourth down and goal from the one yard line. Reno goes gun. Look at all the space up top, Mike. All they got to do is run yep. a little out route. Reno out of the gun. And, uh, well, you know where this is going. Unsuccessful in the back of the end zone. Mm. That was the name of the game. Touchdowns beat field goals every time, and Baltimore holds on to win 21 
to 13. Minnesota's first loss since week two, their season opener against Fort Worth, which is which looks like a pretty good loss um, at this point in the season. But uh, your thoughts on Baltimore's victory? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it, it, you, you can't go up against Baltimore and expect to win a game whenever you can't finish drives. I think it just comes down to that. And Minnesota has not... Um, they've they've been really good all season long. I think that that was really probably their worst performance all season long as far as getting into the red zone and, and capitalizing on points. Um, you know, kudos to the Baltimore defense. They did everything they needed to do. Minnesota was a hot team, debatably one of the hottest in the SFL going into that game, and Baltimore um, just really asserted their dominance as far as the scouting and, and being prepared for everything Minnesota had. He may be the hottest person in Houston if he wears his Sasquatch costume, that is. Mickey Melillo sat down with <laughs> Ashley Jackson after their loss. Back to where I am joined with a great friend of mine, Mr. Mickey Melillo, kicker for the Minnesota legend. Even though he is a divisional rival, one of my good friends. How are you doing, me? I'm good, Ashley. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic, but I know your feelings are a little bit hurt right now coming off that loss to Baltimore, man. That was a great game. And y'all were close. You were that close. Yeah, you know what? The game, the score was a little bit closer than the game. Baltimore just had us all game long. We couldn't ha know how. To, we didn't know how to uh, move the ball down the field. We actually didn't score our first touchdown until the second half. So it was difficult. Just Baltimore had our number. Our defense really kept a, kept that game closer than probably what it should be. So what do you think that you guys are going to have to do? Because right now you're seven and two. You're in a good spot, you know, um, definitely playoff bound. But what do you have to what do you think you guys have to do to get on that same page offensively? I don't think there's much that we have to do. I, I, I think the game plan that Axel and the rest of the front office and coaching staff has done has been great. I just think that Baltimore's game plan against us was perfect. One of the biggest things that we do at Minnesota is we try to get the ball into as many hands as possible, whether it be in the backfield with Colin, Justin, and Knox, or every single receiver touching the ball. Just everybody has a chance to touch the ball that you never know who our weapon will be per game. So that's one of the big game plans the coaching staff, I believe, has done all season. I'm not in the front office anymore. I took a step back. I get to relax now this season. But just seeing it from the outside looking in, I think they've game planned very well. It's just how the other teams game plan against us. Mm. Now, do you believe in home field advantage? Because you guys actually, the last three games to end your season are at home. Do you think that you guys will stand a better chance at winning out? Our record at Northwood speaks for itself. We are very dominant at home. And I do believe there is some sort of home field advantage. But just like the old saying goes, any given Sunday, but in the SFL, it's any given Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. So it's anybody's game any week. Proof is everybody thought that we would have dominated Baltimore, but Baltimore being Baltimore just showed us why they are a multiple championship team. Well, Vicky, thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much for being here. And I cannot wait to see what the Minnesota Legends do for the rest of the season. It's the same thing. And I can't wait to meet you in a couple of weeks in Northwood Stadium with the Scorpions. Hey, man, we're going to do our best to come in and uh, make a blemish on that record. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's the only time I don't like you is for the for the time on the field, Ashley. But let me tell you, we're friends every other time. But you and I, we're going to fight. Hey, let's do it, man. Let's do it. Just make sure you <laughs> kick it to the uprights. Always. <laughs> All right, Mickey. See you soon. You got it. Bye. Bye. Back to you. Thank you, Ashley. A couple things from that interview. First, Mickey first putting of all, the Dukes up. I'm, I know. It's <laughs> frightening. First off, um, Mickey and Ashley play. Look, I have to edit the show down because we got to fit it into a time block. They played some sort of math game where they were on the <laughs> same page. They made me feel so stupid, Mike. I couldn't keep it in because I would I wouldn't know how to even like address the what they did. I don't know. It was it was some voodoo math stuff, and and that's coming from the guy that has to do the playoff scenario. So that's the first. Thing. Oh, the second no. thing is the second <laughs> thing is is it never ceases to amaze me how many places to sit Ashley has in her house, and she sits in none of them in all these interviews. I don't. I, 
I don't know why she hates all of her chairs. She's working it's on that crazy. posture, Cam. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely need that. I can feel my chair way back there not doing a darn thing. Um, always great to see Nikki. Uh, I didn't I didn't realize Minnesota had their last three at home, Mike. That uh, That's pretty scary for everybody else in the SFL. Yeah, it is. That is especially, I mean, somebody of Minnesota's caliber. But I do want to give a shout-out real quick because you and I were talking – um, you know, off air really quick. And I, I mentioned Mickey has, if you haven't gotten a chance to catch Mickey in broadcasting, he's, he's come such a long way and he's, he's so he's, he's killing it. I commented on a, on a game uh, a couple weeks back and, and said, I loved it. And you brought up how Jacob and Mickey called the Indianapolis game this week, Vancouver and said they were exceptional. So shout out Mickey, if you're listening, listening to this, uh, good job to you and Jacob. Yeah, all right, let's get back to the highlights. Let's go to Atlanta now where the undefeated Florida Storm were trying to make some things happen, and that they did early in this one. Art Vandalay, I don't know how you get that wide open on a rollout strong side, but that's what happened there. Art with the touchdown, 7-0. Atlanta would strike back. It's Jason Williams in for the score, 7-7. We're all square. Atlanta, one of the two teams to beat Florida last season, and they would give the Storm all they could handle. Dynasty dropping to throw, just barely gets it off. Look at Henry McGee, the rookie, in double coverage with the catch. Atlanta would get the field goal before the half, made it 10-7. That one floated over uh, Deontay Stoneville, and now all of a sudden Atlanta is up 10 with 5.42 to go, but late in the third. This is just what Florida does this season. Ron Cochran down the field, what a catch. Art mm. Vandalay down to the one yard line and the Storm are in business. As, uh, Art, Art Vandalay was so clutch in this game. He, he really was, he really was. And that and that catch got him down to the one yard line and Ron Cochran was able to give it off to Chris Komisak who punches it in from one yard out, 17-14. Just a couple of plays later, BDG Hollywood fumbles and it's picked up by Florida. This is like deja vu to the Alamo City game. Remember when Brad Jones fumbled there in the third quarter and Florida started to make the comeback. Just can't do this right here. Mm, no, that's crucial. You, you got to expect more out of a veteran like BDG. You got to take care of the football. Third and 10. Dynasty on the rollout. And look at K. Marion. Somehow making the catch. It was the first touchdown against Florida's defense since February 4th in the fourth quarter. Ron Cochran drops to throw, trying to answer back. Mike, that was fourth and 12. Florida's yeah. down four with 2.57 to go. This thing is almost over. Atlanta just has to take care of the football. And if they get a kill shot, they go up 11 and they really put it to bed. Or they throw a pick at the one yard line. And Florida takes it all the way back the other way for the touchdown. Are you kidding me? K. Marion can't catch him. And Florida does it again. 27 to 24. Atlanta falls. What? What? That is wild, man. That's wild. Was that Jesus Smith on the pick? Yep. Sure was. Oh, man. I mean, I, man, I've been a fan of his ever since he came into the league. He is a an outstanding linebacker. That was an incredible play, super clutch play, and it's it's reason it's plays like that that, that Florida is just so hard to beat. You can have the perfect game plan against them, but if you have the perfect game plan and you execute for, you know, like 75 or 80%, you're, I feel like you're going to lose that game. It's crazy. Yeah, and, and not in the highlight was a couple of amazing plays by Chris Porter and Billy Ray Valentine, former defensive linemen who still play on the line as linebackers in that hybrid Atlanta defense. They both had amazing interceptions within two yards of the line of scrimmage um, in that game. Terrific plays, but unfortunately, Mike, Atlanta has a resume problem. They're 5-4, and four, but all of their wins have come against teams uh, that, ha that are below 500, and all their key opportunities to win the san diego game they lost by a point the the um uh the florida game got away from them. they got baltimore this week at some point atlanta's sov is going to come back to bite them uh you know they're definitely not a, a a six and six playoff team right now with that sov so they got to win at least two of their last three and they got to beat somebody worth something yeah. to uh to help them out well i think baltimore is going to be the big test Right. Baltimore is going to be the big test. I mean, you're talking about a Baltimore team that is hot right now that, you know, took down Minnesota. Right. They're they're riding the high. If Atlanta, you know, takes it to Baltimore in that matchup and gets a big win, I, that's surely going to help. All right. So that was the look at Atlanta, Florida. Atlanta still 
doing all right, five and four. Uh, but uh, that SOV struggling, we'll see that in the playoff breakdowns uh, coming up at the end of the show. Back to the highlights. Let's go to Los Angeles, where the Los Angeles Lycans were looking for their first win of the season, and so far, so good there. Sully Richardson to Bubba Tree. Gets a first and goal down to the one-yard line, trailing 3 nothing. Coach Richardson likes it on the sideline, and eventually Los Angeles would punch this one in. But it's to Tommy Rahman, who sits down, finds a little pocket, in the zone of the end zone. That is a score, 7-6. Sully Richardson is picked off. GB Wallace hurdles over two players on the ground. Athletic move there, and he's out of here. And just like that, Queen City looked like they had taken back all the momentum to start the third quarter. Corsairs lead 13-7. The difference in this game, Mike, was that Sully responded, not with an interception, but with more strong play. Over to LZ prior to the four-yard line. Los Angeles did not hang their heads in this one. Yeah, I think that's a big, big factor when you can get Sully Richardson playing at the top of his level. It's going to be, they're going to be a, a team that can compete with any team. Second down and goal after Pryor draws out the defense late in the third quarter, trying to punch it in. Brendan Brennan stall is in the end zone. The extra point is good. Los Angeles takes a 14 to 13 lead. Same score, four minutes later. LA's back in the red zone, trying to go up by eight to get a more comfortable lead. But Queen City, the Empire, strikes back. Pick in the end zone, and the Corsairs right back in it as Pryor was the intended target. Queen City, there you see, was uh, trailing in the yardage department, trailing in the yards per play department, and just could not put the pieces together. TD Jack with the pick. And L.A. would hold on late. They win 17-13. Ashley Jackson caught up with Justin Reside to talk Queen City's loss and more on the final segment of tonight's PGI. We're back with PGI. And I'm joined with a good friend of mine, Mr. Justin Reside, cornerback over from the Queen City Corsairs. And they won off a loss to L.A. Man. 17-13, I know you, I know you probably were sick, man. Like, that's close. It was that close. It's very close. I thought that last catch at the end, I was like, oh, damn, I thought we had a touchdown. And he dropped it. He, he dropped the thing was either, I think it was Adrian Ellis or Matthew Jr. And that had that, dropped that ball. I'm like, oh, my God. I thought we had that game won, but. Yeah, I get props to LA. That's why I'm wearing, in this interview, I'm wearing my Tazzy TCB shirt because I'm giving, you know, Tazzy Blackwell her props for their win, their first one of the season. So. Yeah, and I know that has to feel good for that ball club over there because, you know, when you first win, touching for it, get it in week 10, you know. Um, it's unfortunate, you know, like I said, it's against Queen City, but at the same time, you know, that is a good boost of morale for LA. But, um, so Alex and Chad have seemingly turned um, Queen City around this season. What do you think has been some of the keys to Queen City's success this season, um, even though it didn't show in this particular game? But definitely overall. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely that defense, Alex and Chad. Have definitely, when they brought me in for defense and why on all guys, it's like defense. That defense has definitely changed the change Queen City, but, you know, we gotta, we'll gotta we get our offense together. We just have to move the ball consistently on offense and get Z Jet Zero and McDowell and Zoma involved in the running game. And then, you know, everybody. To, yep, and get everybody like Ellis and Matthew Jr., all those guys, you know, get those guys on that side of that ball in sync, before, you know, because we have Charleston, Portland, and D.C. left, so we could go six and six if everything is gets the goes to plan. If they can get a plan together and it goes perfectly, we can go six and six and hopefully get in the playoff race. So, what is the team morale like over in Queen City nowadays? Because I know you know there was a period of time where you know Queen City wasn't winning. They they weren't you know the same caliber of team that they were um, when they were winning the four championships. So. Now that we've entered into a new game and you're under 
new coaching um, and, and manage, you know, management. How has the team morale changed? Yeah, or has it? Yeah, team morale is pretty good. It's like, hey, if we lose, we'll, we all say, hey, keep, we got to keep grinding. Every game is a new day, you know. New, you know what, if we have to do, try to, we want to know every week. If, you know, if we don't do that, we can keep, just keep grinding, and, you know, see where, where we can go. Okay, gotcha. Well, Justin, I really thank you so much for your time today, and I'm looking forward to seeing which, how Queen City fares for the rest of the season. Yeah, Good luck to you. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. You're welcome. Back to you in the booth. Thank you, Ashley, and it's always uh, good to see a player coming on after a loss. you got to respect that. Uh, Justin Reside taking one for the team there. I want to see Anthony Weil on one of these. Is Anthony Weil even a real person? <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> let's get him on camera. Let's get him talking about uh, SFL football. But, uh, yeah, some obtainable goals there, but if Queen City's going to make the playoffs, they got to win out, and, and they need that, that big win over D.C. to boost their SOV. It's do or die now. Yeah. For sure, absolutely, and I think it's easy. I, I think it's attainable that they they really could win out the stretch. Um, I think that Charleston's going to be a big test for them uh, on Monday Night Football. Yep, and that is next week. Desperation game after Charleston kind of laid an egg on Fort Worth. We'll get to them in a moment, but first we go to the twentieth matchup of Jacksonville and Carolina, and boy, did the Carolina Skyhawks come out firing! Matt South to Vince DeSantis on the first drive, and then. The following drive south to Christian Bacigalupi, 14-0. Carolina on top. At that point, Matt South had like two incompletions. It was ridiculous. But uh, Jacksonville was not going to go away. O.J. Bruin finds Kingston Ellington. Low key, this may have been O.J. Bruin's best game of the season, but his run game not helping him out. Can't do that. Phil Hall <laughs> recovers the fumble. Stinson forced it. For the Skyhawks, they get the football back. 21-7, this was the turning point. 3-10 to go in the third. South is popped, and it's picked off by Tega Clay. Tega is going all the way into the end zone, bouncing, bouncing, bouncing his way to just a seven-point deficit. 21-14 with three minutes to go in the third. This was without John Martin, who got hurt in the second half. Bruin finds Joe Beasley, who muscles his way into the end zone. And just before what the end dart. of regulation, we're going to overtime. The game is tied 21 to 21. What a throw. Yeah, that was a dart, man. You look at the placement. I mean, right over the head of the defender. You can't get any better placement than that. But in overtime, Ike McBride gets away from one. Alex Bond took a poor angle. McBride gets it into the red zone. And the longest drive of the night for Carolina, nearly four minutes, would uh, end up, you can see right on the screen, longest drive of the night would end up in a field goal because McBride kept the wheels churning. One of the best backs in the league. Low key, Mike, one, top five oh, yeah. in average uh, yards per game. And she is really killing it for those Skyhawks. 31-yard field goal uh, by Malone Brown for the win. And Carolina... Does it again. 24-21. Both teams were previously 1-0 in overtime this season. Carolina now 2-0 in overtime, 4-5 overall. Chris Delro with the $5 Super Chat. Skyhawks are staying alive. Now, if only the announcers don't jinx things. That uh, is in <laughs> reference to Mike Daggs talking about Harish Prasad getting hurt at another convention, and then five minutes later his player got hurt in the game. Oh, man. What are you going to do? Yeah. But uh, but Carolina gets uh, gets another W, 4-5. and five. Jacksonville, another well-played game, but uh, they just they just have not found the uh, clutch plays defensively late in games this season to get those wins. Yeah, you got to win it. You got to win the turnover battle. You have to. That's the only way that, you know, you really, I mean, outside of, you know, rare events, most of the time if you're turning the ball over more than you're taking it away, you're not going to be winning a lot of football games. I will say this, though. You talked about Ike McBride and how she's kind of like low-key one of the top five backs mm -hmm. in, in, in the SFL. I think that she is second to none in the SFL whenever the team needs her late in the game. Mm. Like, she's, when yeah. you think about running backs, think about those two, both of their victories that came within like the, the final minutes or walk-off, right, this season, yep. it's been on the back of Ike McBride. And she's not a first-half back. She really kind of gets the legs churning in the second the old half. workhorse. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So 
Carolina, as long as they're you know playing from ahead, it's been a good strategy so far. They come out pass first in the first half. Seems to work. They build a lead, and then Ike McBride finishes it off. Uh, so Carolina, three games left. They're still in the thick of it at four and five. Left for dead just a couple of weeks ago. They are on their way. This game was not a blowout, but cut for time as uh, we're trying to get to our Monday Night Spectacular tonight. D.C. beats Motor City 23-13. to This was an interesting one, but you see there at the bottom, no touchdowns in two red yeah. zone trips. Motor City, like, I think it's crazy that they averaged better starting field position by 10 yards, and they still had the ball over five more minutes than D.C. Nothing's easy for the V8s, but they don't make it easy on their opponents either. Just couldn't come up with the uh, with the big plays in this one. Yeah, absolutely. I think for Motor City, it's just about figuring out how to capitalize and and, and finish drives. I mean, that's that's the biggest thing. You've got the weapons to do it. You know, we've talked about Johan Sutherland being one of the most underrated wide receivers in the game right now. Um, they've got the weapons. Uh, you just got to figure out how to finish drives. That's what it comes down to. The Dragons just before the first half expired got a fumble as Motor City was trying to run out the clock, and Declan O'Rourke took it back for a touchdown. That was a huge game-changing swing play there, and uh, DC never looked back, so they get another win. Fort Worth clobbered Charleston. That was another one of these, like, 6.30 primetime games, Mike, where we're like, oh, can't wait for this one. Could be the game of the week, and it falls flat on us. Uh, Fort Worth built a 27-7 lead in the first half, and because they did that, Charleston had no running game. They ran the ball, like, yeah. eight times. Uh, they just couldn't establish a run. There was way too much pressure on John Lakeman. And as the commentators pointed out during this game, in wins and losses, John Lakeman just is turning the ball over way too much. And this Predator yeah. team is not going to be a playoff team unless he can't, unless he cleans that up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, uh, you, there's only it, it's basic football. You you got to be able to take care of the football and protect the football. But I think the big thing in this is. You can't allow another team. You can't allow the other team to get off to such a hard, hot start. Charleston is not a um, like a high flying offense by any means, right? They kind of have always, at least this season, they've ridden on the strength of the defense, and and Lakeman and the offense have done just enough to win games. And this one got out of hand early, and and I think that that's really the difference in this. I think that you know if, if Charleston holds that to you know even seven seven, if fourteen seven in the first half. I think you're looking at an entirely different ball game. So I think it just it, it's just about getting down early. Charleston has to make sure that, that they start out hot moving forward. Yeah, and they, they've been a second-half team in this four-game win streak, but when you play some of the best teams like Fort Worth, sometimes... Oh, they've been. They've had a some, hard yeah, <laughs> Sometimes They have, but sometimes being a hard, uh, just a second-half team is just not enough to win the game. Alamo City beat Louisiana 26-7. That started the week. Louisiana's offense are really struggling right now, and I think yards per pass really tells the story, Mike, because they were 24th coming in and only five yards per attempt for, for Louisiana. They just have not been able to figure out the deep passing attack. They got dominated on time of possession. You see they only had 18 runs. Now, to be fair to Louisiana, Dwayne Sammons did get hurt, but this, uh, Mike, Cameron Collier, John Michael Suddeth, remember when they won that game a couple weeks ago? Yeah. We're like, hey, I think they found something. They barely had any touches in this game. They got to figure out how to get those guys going. I, I think that's their identity right now, at least with yeah. this team anyway. Yeah, so whenever they got that huge win a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about it on the show, we talked about how Louisiana, their identity really should be essentially, you know, the big body, you know, bully ball. Like, you've got really good backs. You've got big receivers and big tight ends. Like, you know, you got to play the possession game and everything, but... You can't come out here passing 39 times like that's just not like you you have to the pass has to stem from the run not the other way around yeah of course they got down too so it's and, and salmon's got hurt it of just course, it, yeah. it all uh it all just got got messy for louisiana there alamo city goes to five and four they are a game back in the south all right back to the highlights we got a couple more games to get to before we wrap up this week's show let's go back to friday as mexico city was in houston and jacob morrison gets the one yard touchdown houston says uh, i could do that too from one yard out josh slap gets in the end zone from day birth a one yard line would be really important in this one uh, as as houston ties the game up at seven mike you were on the call for this one almost yeah 
and then you were. And so close. Yeah, it was it a was... close call. I mean, the flight was delayed. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Se it was. Burr seven out of ten before hitting bovine here. Burr and the Houston offense really started heating up in the third quarter, and it it, it looked like they were going to run away for the, with this one for a while. Yeah, it did. And, I mean, you see, like, Mexico City did such a good job um, staying in this game and, and really just fighting. I mean, this was this was the epitome. I, I made a joke with Curtis, who was on the call with me, about how the South is, like, the most physical matchup division in the SFL, hands down. Yeah, and just as you say that, it's pretty brutal out there as Sype <laughs> gets crushed by Chris Britton the third, third and 19 at this point, buried in their own territory down seven with 205 to go in the third quarter this this is this is when you i mean lace up your shoes double knot them and say we got to go get this thing noe tarasis all the way yeah. down the field of the 48 yard line on a third and 19 conversion mexico yep. city breathes a sigh of relief and they regroup start of the that was fourth a huge quarter momentum shift Absolutely. Down 14-7. Another third down. Pressure from the backside. Doesn't matter. Noe Tarasas again. Touchdown. A season high for Tarasas in the Mexico City Aztec uniform. Just like that, we are tied at 14. The ensuing possession. Dexter Jackson. Eyes in the back of his head. Comes up with the play. Mike St. Green goes, oh my gosh, you're getting my jersey dirty. I'm going to, like, break a nail. I don't know what's happening. Fourth down and three, down six now. Hey, Mike St. Green delivers right there. Houston burns their last time out. DR Sim makes a phenomenal play on the sideline to stop the clock and give Houston three chances inside the five-yard line. But on fourth and goal at the one, Dave Burr for the win. Just couldn't make it happen because... The Hall of Famer, Max Jackson's on the other side of the football, Mike. Oh, man, Max Jackson was in the right position the entire the entirety of this game. And you see him there. They're trying to force it to DR Sim, and, and Max Jackson knows exactly where it's going, right? He's seen this, this movie, the ending of this movie, so many times. Um, and, you know, look, DR Sim made a couple really clutch plays in that game, and, and Max Jackson kind of he let go of a few of them he was in position to get a couple interceptions throughout that game and couldn't hang on to him and it's kind of crazy that he comes up big in the end zone like that and, and it's just such a huge huge win for the mexico city organization uh, houston i mean kudos to both teams like that was a well fought game the bottom line is jordan to, jordan site played spectacular like jordan site played great the Mexico City offense played great, and and bottom line is, you know, the, the defense for Mexico City is a legitimate secondary, and uh, I mean they're going to be hard uh, if they get some momentum. That's a that's a team that really, you know, you have to look out for. We saw some quarterbacks this week that have struggled at times this season, played really well. OJ Bruin, yeah. Matt South, Jordan Sipe. I mean, they had some of their best games of the season. Yeah. As teams start to figure it out, Mexico City four and five, Houston five and four. The South is still a mess. Last highlight of the week, that is Vancouver and Indy, and it definitely was at least Kendra Wells. Welcome to the party. Opening drive touchdown, Vancouver's offense was firing on all cylinders in the first. They grabbed a 10-0 lead. Indianapolis got it going in the second. Christian Pierce ends that drive, makes it 10-7. Ramblers down just three. Flash forward to the third, same score. And once we got to the second half, both offenses started clicking on all cylinders. Ryan Roosevelt, Gets into the end zone for the score. 14-10. Indianapolis takes their first lead of the game. Two plays later, it's Christian Brown to Kendra Wells. And it's Indy's defenders running into each other. And she's out of here. What a late block. The longest pass of Vancouver's season, O'Neal, before that play was 37 yards. 75 wow. yards for Wells. Tie game at 17, 906 to go in the fourth. Christian Brown. In zone, Brett Killian found the soft spot, sat down, and got six. 24-17, 6.20 to go. Hand off Tino Sosa. Look at the blocking down the field. Harleman getting out there and getting a big boy block. Makes it first down and goal for Indy. And what Sosa couldn't finish off, his teammate Christian Pierce does. Stiff arm extraordinaire. What a play at the one-yard line. Tie game at 24. 5.12 to go. In the fourth, but Vancouver would not allow Indy's offense back on the field. Christian Brown down the field. Kendra Wells 
inside the 40. Yak, 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 yak. All the way down to the 36 yard line. 40 seconds to go as Vancouver looks to get into field goal range. Brown hands the ball off. Redford not even touched until about 12 yards down the field. And that sets up not a chance to win, but a to win to win. Field goal, whoa, looking a little shaky. It's good. And Vancouver wins 27 to 24. Goes to five and four. Indy drops to four and five. If you're either team, you can't be mad at that one. That was a classic. No, no, that's now I can understand after watching the highlights. Now I can understand why Jacob said uh, that was playoff football. It looked like playoff football. And so that's it. That's exciting. It, you know, I, I kind of wish Indy pulled that one out just because a little bias being in the Pacific Division. But kudos <laughs> to Vancouver, man. I'll tell you what, whenever you have receivers like Kendra Wells making plays like that uh, and, and continuing the football, like that was a crazy stat that they, you know, their longest pass before was only in the 30s uh, as far yeah. as yardage. I mean, incredible. Anytime you get your playmakers working like that, like Vancouver did, um, you know, it's just good to see see them good, get a win. And Indy is a Indy is strong as ever. I'll tell you what, Indy is a, a really, really strong looking team this season, and they're really shaping it up at the end of the season for sure. So Van, just like they do every year, about four and four at this point, and they get the You're clutch like, what win. time is it? Yeah. Yeah, what time is it? <laughs> Vancouver time. That's right. Playoff yeah. picture coming up. Nine minutes to the kickoff of Monday Night Spectacular, and here's your updated look. Florida has an SOV lead on Canton now of .001. So uh, Florida gets into the top spot for the first time. Uh, Fort Worth is sitting there in fifth all by them, themselves. San Diego, your Mavericks in sixth. Y'all play Seattle tonight, who's in 12th. If, if San Diego wins, you maintain the lead in the Pacific. If you lose, Vancouver you takes the, the lead yeah. in the Pacific and would move up to the sixth seed as the top five and four team as a division leader. You see Baltimore surging uh, in the rankings at five and four, they have a 503 strength of victory, whereas Atlanta is the weakest five and four team. They have a 317 strength of victory. Those two play each other next week, Saturday mm. at 9 p.m. Eastern. That is a monster game, especially for Atlanta, uh, trying to uh, pull that victory out. Houston, Alamo City, Vancouver in the mix. The difference between 12 and 13 is Seattle's head-to-head -head win over Tulsa. Uh, in their uh, third game of the season. And then Indianapolis is your strongest mm. strongest four and five team right now at a 438 SOV. Your thoughts on the updated playoff standings with four weeks and a game to go. Yeah, well, I have a headache just looking at it. So um, I think that yeah, I'm looking at this and I'm, I mean, anything can happen. I mean, this is, this is insane. Like Mark, Mark Lopez just commented in the chat that moving from 10th to 6th seed just shows you how close that middle of the pack group is. I mean, that is un unreal. Like this, this it's so tight. The end of this race, it's going to be so much fun to watch. We're shaping up for one of the best, in my opinion, one of the best playoff runs, I think, in SFL history. The sixth team and the 14th team is the same amount of wins. And really, really, Mike, or it's 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 a top five right now. I mean, I think Fort yeah. Worth has has proven themselves that sure. uh, that they, that they are in that mix. Minnesota is obviously very good. DC six through about eighteen, any yeah. of those teams can beat each other. It's it's really yeah. crazy. <laughs> like I don't necessarily think that we have the parity at the very top of the league that maybe we have had in years past. But that middle is is. I mean, it's as large as I've seen it, right? The from yeah. from six to eighteen, nineteen, maybe even twenty. Uh, it's crazy. I was just trying to think of something that the that people weren't going to pause me over. So, but yeah, it's just it's <laughs> it's nuts, right? It's just nuts. It is it is crazy. I mean, uh, you said it best. The top end, right? I think is a little bit more defined, right? The top four or five teams. Um, but again. It, I don't see this. It, what it's shaping up, Cam, is is going to be an extremely exciting first weekend of playoff football. Whenever we finally get there, yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, quarterfinal week c comes, and we're like, oh gosh, <laughs> here we go. You know, <laughs> trying to take down the Giants. We've seen that so many times in the SFL before. All right, let's take a look at our Monday night Ooh. preview. No X's and O's tonight, since Mike and his team are involved, but he'll give some keys coming up here in a minute. Uh, these, these teams have only met now for twice. 
Uh, Seattle won the first meeting. As I mentioned, San Diego keeps the lead in the Pacific. If they win, Vancouver takes over if they mm-hmm. lose. Both teams have struggled with turnover differential um, throughout yeah. the season, so that's going to be key tonight. Uh, Seattle has the number one rush defense now. They've taken over for Fort Worth, just 2.5 yards per carry allowed, uh, but they do give up a lot through the pass, so I'm guessing we're going to see a lot uh, through the air out of San Diego tonight, uh, but you can let us know. Johnny 2K. Uh, Johnny Pickler, he's close to a couple milestones. He's 223 yards from passing E.T. King for 11th all-time, and he's four touchdowns away from passing E.T. King for 13th all-time. So we're really going to be taking a look, a uh, close look at Pickler tonight. So how do you see this game, Mike? Uh, uh, break it down for us. Well, I mean, listen, Seattle's got a ton of talent on their roster, right? They've got a lot of speed. If I'm looking at this, you know, as the coach for San Diego, I'm going into this game and I'm thinking, okay, what do I need to do defensively against this offense? And I think it all starts with type attack, right? It all starts with keeping type attack in the pocket, right? We have to make sure we're containing him because we know how explosive he is if he gets outside of the the pocket. And we know how, how great he is at extending plays and creating something out of nothing. So we have to keep him in the pocket while simultaneously really shutting down the run game. We can't allow Baloo Scott to get going, right? Or, or J.W. Doyle. We can't allow them to do that because what that does is it opens up, even though they don't see, you know, on the outside, they don't have as much talent as you would think. They do a really good job with their receivers, um, you know, getting them involved in everything. And normally that stems off the run game. The second they get the run game going, the pass lanes open up and it's a, it's a, a really, really tough thing to stop. So I think that all starts with really containing the run and keeping Patak inside the pocket. It's going to be a big thing for us. So that's that's going to be a huge factor in the game. Um, now looking at at their uh, their defense, I mean they've got a lot of speed on defense, right? We know that Doug Days had had a really good season uh, at strong safety. They kind of fill him in in different spots. He plays linebacker sometimes, strong safety. I'll move him over to free safety and slot. I mean, they move him everywhere. So we know we have to be smart about it. We have to make sure Pickler is smart with the football and protects the football and does not try and turn it over. We've done really good with not turning the ball over so much uh, within the past six games, and we have to continue that. We um, we are not. We don't have any top rushers uh, on our team, but we are are really good at balancing it out and doing just enough in the run game to open up everything for for Pickler. So. You know, I think that we've seen Benji Matson on offense uh, go off as our tight end. I think he's going to be a huge factor tonight. Um, huge factor as far as, you know, trying to get matched up against some linebackers and, and really create some mismatches on offense. Uh, and, you know, since we're mentioning one tight end, we need to mention the other. Polly Truth has had an exceptional season for Seattle, and he's going to be tough to contain. You know, we like to, uh, we like to move around our personnel a little bit in defense and Really, these two teams, San Diego and Seattle, are very similar personnel-wise um, across the board. So it's going to be an interesting thing. I think it's going to come down to uh, one to two plays. I think this game will come down to one to two plays where, you know, if they swing one way, it could be, you know, the deciding factor of the game. And if they swing the other, it could just as easily be decided the other way. So the biggest thing for us, again, is containing type attack. Uh, and on defense, we have to take care of the football. We can't allow them to to make, you know, we saw Doug Day with a couple pick sixes this season. We can't allow that to happen. We can't get behind. We are an offense that plays ahead, and that's when we're at our best. So, um, you know, really, it's just going to be about staying ahead of the chains for us on offense and, you know, really just protecting the football against this really, really sneaky good defense, um, you know, as far as the secondary goes. There you go. You said everything I was going to say, Mike. I don't even have to call the game anymore. We can just sit back and watch. <laughs> uh, can you tell Mike O'Neill is passionate, folks, his, uh, San, his San Diego Mavericks. Coming up to take on Seattle here in a little bit. Michael Gott is new in the chat. Welcome. The game not in this chat room, but it is on our channel. Find San Diego and Seattle. That's the Monday Night Spectacular coming up next. And this was the SFL This Week, Season 22, Week 10 edition. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week for uh, another great show and another great recap of SFL action for Michael Neon, Cameron Irvine. And I'll be right back with Charles Doherty and the rest of our Monday Night Spectacular crew. Call San Diego and Seattle coming up next.